This week on ANN, the president of the Adventist Church meets with the Prime Minister of Egypt. Members of the Adventist Church in Jamaica appeal to the government and community to remember principles of religious liberty. And 1,600 youth leaders gather in Germany for the Global Youth Leaders Congress. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. The Prime Minister of Egypt, Mustafa Madbouli, welcomed the President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ted N.C. Wilson, and a small Adventist delegation to the Government Palace hours after church leaders opened the Ramses Cultural Center in Cairo. During the meeting, Wilson expressed his gratitude to the Prime Minister for the religious freedom that allows the church to help improve communities through initiatives such as the Ramsey Cultural Center. Mad Bouli, for his part, talked to the delegation about the religious and cultural history of the Egyptian people and emphasized the government's tolerance for various religions and cultures. He also told his Adventist guests that the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, had specifically asked him to meet with them. Rick McEdward, president of the Middle East North Africa Union, who was also in attendance, said the meeting itself sent a strong signal that the government is open to fostering a climate of freedom for worship. During the meeting, Wilson noted that Madbouli faces heavy responsibilities after being appointed prime minister in early June and simultaneously retaining his previous position as government minister for housing and urban utilities. With the Prime Minister's consent, Wilson offered some leadership advice from the Bible. Opening his Bible to Micah 6.8, he read, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jamaica recently appealed to employers in the private and public sector to respect the constitutional rights of workers to enjoy freedom from religious discrimination. The appeal made reference to a release from the, the National Workers Union, which indicated, among other things, that a worker at the Petroleum Company of Jamaica had been suspended without pay since December of 2017 because he refused to work on Saturday, his day of worship. Nigel Koch, Director for Communication, Public Affairs, and Religious Liberty for the church in Jamaica, said he had spoken to the worker last week and that the worker felt his rights had been infringed. Days after the appeal from the church came out, Petcom's officials said in a statement that the worker would be allowed to return on July 30. In another recent case, a student enrolled in the National Summer Job Program was denied work and was sent home upon hearing that he could not work on Saturdays. The church intervened in this student's situation and he too was reinstated and allowed to start work again on July 30. More than 1,600 youth leaders gathered in Kassel, Germany for the Pass It On Impact Europe Global Youth Leaders Congress. The object of the Congress was to equip, empower, and engage a generation of youth leaders to pass on the legacy of the Reformation. During the Global Youth Leader Congress, the Adventist Church unveiled two new special edition Bibles, one for adventurer age children and another for youth. Victor Huber, Communication Director for the Adventist Church in the Trans-European Region, talked to Mario Martinelli, Director of the Adventist Publishing House in Spain, to hear more about this exciting development. fascinating things at this Global Youth Congress is the launch of a brand new Bible and there's nobody better to talk to me about it than Mario. You've, you've actually, you've got four Bibles in your hand now. <laughs> What's going on here, Mario? Well, uh, actually, uh, we started uh, partnering with the General Conference Youth Ministries Department and uh, some years ago we first uh, uh, produced uh, the uh, Pathfinders Bible and uh, at this uh, uh, Global Youth Leaders Congress, uh, we launched yesterday uh, two new Bibles. Uh, one is the Adventures Club Bible that is available in two covers, and uh, the uh, well-expected uh, Youth Bible that is also available in uh, two covers. Uh, both of these Bibles are available now, initially, in three languages, English, uh, Spanish, and French. Okay, I'm sticking with the English one, much as I want to learn skills. But, to be honest, a Bible is a Bible is a Bible. 
why do we suddenly need four new Bibles particularly focused on pathfinders or youth or, or children? Why the need? Well, uh, it's a very good question, uh, Victor, because uh, these Bibles not only feature the Bible text, they are not uh, just uh, regular, ordinary Bibles. They feature uh, lots and lots of extra content that are very relevant to the different uh, you know, segments to which they are addressed to. So both uh, you know, uh, these Bibles, they have uh, an outstanding content which makes the Bible more relevant and more attractive uh, according to the different you know needs uh, of this uh, different segments and, and and this one we really got modern haven't we we've even got QR codes in it yes yes uh, this uh, youth Bible is uh, really special because it's the very first Bible in the market not uh, you know only in the Adventist uh, church but you know even outside uh, uh, to to have uh, you know QR codes that people can uh, access uh, with uh, you know their uh, uh, phones or their tablets, uh, so they can just uh, you know uh, read the the code with their phones or uh, with their iPads, and uh, they from there can have the access to the articles. Uh, you know, addressing the different topics with the, with the QR code. But uh, this particular Bible uh, not only has, you know, the uh, QR codes, it, it has many, many more features. Uh, it has, for example, uh, a complete plan for uh, marking and coloring the Bible. If you would like to hear more of this interview or read more stories from the Global Youth Leadership Congress, visit tedadventist.org. We'll be back in the coming weeks with more stories from the Global Youth Leadership Congress. An Adventist pastor was one of 10 people to receive a medal from Solomon Islands Governor General Frank Kabui during the country's celebration of 40 years of independence. Pastor George Fafal, senior pastor of Kukum Adventist Church, was awarded the service to Solomon Islands Medal for his long and dedicated service to the Solomon's people in the area of religion. His immediate family and some extended family members were present at the event, held in Honoria, the country's capital. Silent Tavosia, president of the Adventist Church in the Solomon Islands, congratulated Fafal on his service. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Solomon Islands joins the nation in congratulating Pastor Fafal for his distinguished service to the cause of God. Coming up, the International Mission Congress and Game Meetings kicked off this week in Korea. But up next, ANN went to the Brazilian Amazon with Adra Connections. Our report is coming up. We were a group of women outside the city gate by the river at a place of prayer. Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from Thyatira, was also there. Two men came along and started to speak to us and asked to join us in prayer. We later learned that they were Paul and Silas. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to heed Paul's message. She and all the members of her household were baptized. Another day, Paul and Silas were on their way to a place of prayer. They were met by a female slave who had a spirit in her that could predict the future. She earned a lot of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed us and shouted at us. This was disrupting and so Paul ordered the spirit out of her. When her owners realized that their chance of making money was gone, they dragged Paul and Silas to the authorities and they were put in prison. At around midnight, these two very positive prisoners named Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The rest of us were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the prison shook. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, saw all the doors open and drew his sword to kill himself. He thought all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul assured him and shouted that he should not harm himself. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and lay in front of them, trembling. The jailer accepted Jesus Christ and his whole family was baptized. Welcome back. 
Recently, we joined Agile Connections as they launched the first Agile Connections Extreme in the Brazilian Amazon. More than 200 college students from around the United States and Brazil worked for two weeks to build a dormitory, a library, and classrooms for children in this remote area. Here is our report. From July 8 to 22, more than 150 college students from the United States and Brazil traveled 24 hours down the Amazon River from Manaus, Brazil for the first Adra Connections Extreme. The goal of the trip was to complete the Adventist Technical School of Masari or ETAM that will eventually have 20 buildings including a dorm, cafeteria, library, and several classrooms. The school is being built for ages 5 to 13. Attending the school, which includes the living in the dorm, food and books, will be free for the community. We are in the middle of the Amazon rainforest building a school for the communities that surround this place called Nova Jerusalem. And we're going to have about 200 students able to study here at the school when before they would never have been able to have a school opportunity like this. Everything about this school is designed to provide an opportunity of education that was impossible before this school came. And we're not going to charge anything. It's going to be a free opportunity for any student in the area of these communities surrounding the school. This is a really large project for two main reasons. Number one, there's a lot of students here that need access to education that previously had they had no access to education. And number two, we have a lot of university students that wanted to get involved in a project, but also wanted to connect with each other. So we created a program called Adra Connections Extreme that is designed specifically for large scale projects. So we bring multiple universities together from both Brazil and the United States, all in one spot with one purpose and one goal, and that's to build this school. We're out in an extreme environment. We're calling it Adra Extreme for a reason. We are extreme in the scale of the project. It's also extreme in the living conditions, but that's the fun about it. You're experiencing new things, pushing yourself to a limit, maybe breaking a barrier you once had for yourself, and really learning about who you are, learning about who others are, and getting closer connected to nature and to God who made nature. Many of the students who attended felt called to come on this trip. Mark Walton, a pharmacy student from Loma Linda University, had never been outside the United States. He had always wanted to go on a mission trip, but this was his first opportunity. While it was hard at first, the experience turned into a remarkable blessing. Coming from New York City, it's been pretty rough. I'm used to paved roads and not getting my hands dirty, so stepping into this area, the Amazon, was a pretty large step for me. It's, it's all a new experience for me. But um, each passing day, I'm becoming more comfortable. I would recommend a mission trip to a friend because it opens your eyes, it gives you a new perspective on life. I never felt so grateful to feel breeze. I was never so thankful to have water. You take all these things for granted until you reach this area and you see why the simple things make people in these villages very happy. The Lord says in the Bible that we must feed the hungry and clothe the homeless, take care of the orphan. And um, by doing these mission services, we're going ahead and fulfilling these duties that the Lord has um, put upon us. The tagline for Adra Connections is, it's more than just a mission trip. And you can see that in every aspect of what the Adra staff and young people did during their two weeks on the Amazon. Service to everyone here is a way of life and the trip wasn't just limited to college students. We love learning about other cultures in all the places we've lived because um, I guess you'd say we're adventurous. <laughs> the highlight of the whole thing is just being here actually. It's just a wonderful place. It's been a wonderful experience. And we have been privileged to help with uh, painting some of the buildings which are being constructed by Adra. I've done a lot of painting. But one of the biggest exciting things, I think, are all the young people that have come from all the different colleges. They are exceptional kids. We love the enthusiasm and excitement that they have brought with them. And they've accepted us even at our advanced ages. <laughs> This is terrific, especially for people um, that are retired because they have the time and you feel like you are um, contributing something uh, that 
will be a life-changing experience for the young people. You're not here just to serve yourself or your family, you're here to serve others. And I think that's a very important idea, uh, that, that uh, the idea of service being inculcated into the young people. Plans for the future include building a new secondary school at the same location. During his speech at the ETAM dedication, Dean of the Adventist University of Brazil, Martin Kuhn, announced that if Adra can bring internet to the campus, he will personally make sure Satellite University campus is available on campus. Because of the work of Adra Brazil and Adra International and each of the university volunteers that took time from their vacation to volunteer with Adra Connections, these young students will have an education and future they didn't know was possible. If your school, church, or even business would like to join ADRA on an ADRA Connections trip, visit adraconnections.org. Seventh-day Adventists on the Caribbean island of St. Eustatius recently donated 10 traffic mirrors to enhance road safety across the island. Chief of Police Roberto Hodge expressed his gratitude to the Adventist Church for partnering with the police in its attempt to make the roads safer and more user-friendly. Many safety mirrors were damaged by the passage of Hurricane Irma nearly a year ago and had not been replaced. The church on the small island is continually engaging in community outreach activities. They have community cleanup days, paint homes for the elderly, and recently started a soup kitchen, which operates twice a week. They also operate a clothing outlet for the less fortunate on the island. The church also donated funds to assist families hurt, affected by Hurricane Irma last September. Virgil Sams, pastor of St. Eustatius Adventist Church, the only Adventist church on the island, said, we are helping to build a positive image of the church where the hearts of the inhabitants of the island would be softened towards the gospel message. This week, the International Mission Congress, or IMC, kicked off in Seoul, Korea. The event, sponsored by the Adventist Church in the Northern Asia Pacific Territory, brings together missionaries from all over the world. At the same time, as the IMC, the communication department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, launched this year's GAIN Conference. Mm. The conference held at the same time as the Mission Congress aimed to put the church's brand and promise front and center. Both of these conferences had just started at the time of this recording, so we'll be back next week with more information. Coming up, Emily Mastrapa is here to highlight humanitarians around the world. But up next, Adventist Mission shares a story about the importance and challenges of church planting. When I was much younger, uh, in elementary school, there was a school that was just down the street that my parents wanted to enroll myself as well as my siblings in. And they went to enroll us in the school that was fairly close and were told that they had enough persons that looked like us in the school and that we needed to go to a different school because they were only going to take so many of us. And then we went to the school that was a greater distance away. It impacted me so much to understand and realize that someone else was telling me what I could and could not do and where I could be educated or not educated just simply because of what I looked like, the color of my skin, knowing nothing about my character, knowing nothing about my person. So at that point, it let me know that there's got to be a better way and there must be something that can be done to assist other persons in my situation. Welcome back. Every year, thousands of Seventh-day Adventists set out to plant a church. We thank God for literally thousands of new groups that have been planted and established since Global Mission began in 1990. Yet the challenge remains. Adventist Mission has more. When you plant a seed, you water it. You let it soak up the sunshine. And you let God do His part to make it grow. So what if we aren't planting vegetables or flowers? What if we are planting churches? Every year, thousands of Seventh-day Adventists set out to plant a church. Some are pastors. Some are lay people, such as global mission pioneers. These church planters go into an area where there is no Seventh-day Adventist church. Some church planters go out on their own. Some are sponsored by their conference or mission. 
Some, like Global Mission Pioneers, are sent out thanks to generous supporters who believe that we have a mission to reach the unreached. Church planting is not some new method. It goes right back to the early Christian church. It was through church planting that the early Christian church multiplied. Everywhere the Apostle Paul went, he couldn't stop talking about a risen Savior. He had a message of hope that he couldn't keep to himself. The Adventist church grew in the same way. They had a unique message to share with the world, but they only had one local church in Washington, New Hampshire. But that quickly changed as Adventists started crisscrossing the country, starting new groups of believers. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has grown tremendously since those early years. In 2016, a new Adventist Church was established every 3.3 hours somewhere in the world. Yet despite tremendous growth, there are many people who have still not heard the Adventist message or even the name of Jesus. In fact, two-thirds of the entire population of this planet don't know Jesus. Sometimes people ask, why church planting, church planting, church planting? Why the emphasis on church planting? Global Mission is all about church planting. Why, why? The answer to that is because we are wanting to expand our borders. If we continue to put all of our resources into the same places that we've always put our resources, we're not going to grow. We're not going to move into the unreached people groups, those who haven't yet, yet heard of Jesus. People will sometimes say, I go to a church and it's not even half full. Why don't we fill that one first? If we did that, we would still be in New Hampshire. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is all about growing, moving into unreached groups, starting churches where there are none, because that is what Jesus asked us to do. And then, he said, he'll be able to return. The Great Commission is to go into all of the world, to all people groups, to make disciples. And discipleship takes place among groups of believers. We thank God for the literally thousands of new groups that have been planted and established since Global Mission began in 1990. Yet the challenge remains. Thank you for your prayerful support of sending more church planters into the field. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org, then click on videos at the top. The Adventist Church believes each of us needs to help those who are struggling. Christ called us to heal the sick, feed the hungry, and clothe the naked. For this week's social media highlight, Emily Mastrapa shares how you can get involved in World Humanitarian Day. Every day, people in cities and towns struggle to find food, water, and safe shelter while fighting drives millions from their homes. Children are recruited and used to fight while their schools are being destroyed. World Humanitarian Day is held every year on August 19 to pay tribute to aid workers who risk their lives in humanitarian service and to rally support for people affected by crises around the world. This year, World Humanitarian Day is working to bring attention to the millions of civilians affected by armed conflict every day. As humanitarian workers deliver aid and medical workers treat the wounded and sick, they are targeted, treated as threats, and prevented from bringing relief to, and care to those who need it. Visit un.org to learn more and to find resources.
You can also follow along and share your thoughts with the hashtag NotAtarget. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, is the global humanitarian organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. ADRA delivers assistance to individuals in more than 130 countries. You can learn more about ADRA at adra.org or on Facebook at Join ADRA. And finally for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, Ethel H. Tolhurst, a pastor and evangelist from New Zealand, passed away. Welcome to this week in Adventist history. For part of this week and beyond, August 9 to 19 in 1901, a camp meeting took place at Ostel in the U.S. state of Georgia, where the Georgia Conference was organized with C.A. Hall as president. There were then five churches and 131 members in the conference. Modern conference borders don't allow us to be certain how many Seventh-day Adventists there are in the state of Georgia today, but it is certainly in the tens of thousands. On August 7, just a year ago, Athel H. Tolhurst died in Auckland, New Zealand. Tolhurst was born in 1935 to missionary parents in Tonga. A graduate of Avondale College, he worked as a pastor and evangelist in Australia from 1957 until elected president of the North New South Wales Conference in 1975. In 1980, he was elected president of the Trans-Tasman Union Conference. After five years in that position, Tolhurst was elected as secretary of the South Pacific Division, a position in which he served until 1991. In 1992, he became Under Secretary of the General Conference and served in that position until 2005, whereupon he and his wife Lindley retired in Australia. A man of considerable integrity and shrewd insight, he had to navigate troubled waters as a church leader in Australia and New Zealand in the early 1980s. As General Conference Under Secretary, he was understated made a considerable impact. He remained active and was conducting training for pastors in his birth country of Tonga at the age of 82 when he suffered a stroke. He died soon after, despite medical evacuation to New Zealand. That was this week in Seventh-day Adventist history. Thanks for watching in and join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your feedback and tell us how your church is making a difference in its community. Be sure to capture plenty of video footage and photos, then write up a summary of the event's important details, and feel free to send full video reports as well. You can reach us by sending an email to annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The passage says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. That's our program for this week, and remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.